Prologue to the Mysteries of London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Corrie Samuel. The Mysteries of London by George W. M. Reynolds. Volume 1. Prologue. Between the tenth and thirteenth centuries, civilization withdrew from Egypt and Syria, rested for a little space at Constantinople, and then passed sway to the western climes of Europe. From that period, these climes have been the grand laboratory in which civilization has wrought out refinement in every art and every science, and whence it has diffused its benefits over the earth. It has taught commerce to plough the waves of every sea with the adventurous keel. It has enabled handfuls of disciplined warriors to subdue the mighty armaments of Oriental princes, and its daring sons have planted its banners amidst the eternal ice of the poles. It has cut down the primitive forests of America, carried trade into the interior of Africa, annihilated time and distance by the aid of steam, and now contemplates how to force a passage through Suez and Panama. The bounties of civilization are at present almost everywhere recognized. Nevertheless, for centuries has civilization established, and for centuries will it maintain its headquarters in the great cities of Western Europe, and with civilization does vice go hand in hand. Amongst these cities there is one in which contrasts of a strange nature exist. The most unbounded wealth is the neighbour of the most hideous poverty. The most gorgeous pomp is placed in strong relief by the most deplorable squalor. The most seducing luxury is only separated by a narrow wall from the most appalling misery. The crumbs which fall from the tables of the rich would appear delicious viands to starving millions. And yet those millions obtain them not. In that city there are in all districts five prominent buildings, the church in which the pious pray, the gin palace to which the wretched poor resort to drown their sorrows, the pawnbrokers, where miserable creatures pledge their raiment, and their children's raiment, even unto the last rag, to obtain the means of purchasing food, and alas, too often, intoxicating drink. The prison, where the victims of a vitiated condition of society expiate the crimes to which they have been driven by starvation and despair, and the workhouse, to which the destitute, the aged, and the friendless hasten to lay down their aching heads and die. And congregated together in one district of this city, is an assemblage of palaces, whence emanate by night the delicious sounds of music, within whose walls the foot treads upon rich carpets, whose sideboards are covered with plate, whose cellars contain the choicest nectar of the temperate and torrid zones, and whose inmates recline beneath velvet canopies, feast at each meal upon the collated produce of four worlds, and scarcely have to breathe a wish before they find it gratified. Alas! how appalling are these contrasts! And, as if to hide its infamy from the face of heaven, this city wears upon its brow an everlasting cloud, which even the fresh fan of the morning fails to disperse for a single hour each day. And in one delicious spot of that mighty city, whose thousand towers point upwards from horizon to horizon as an index of its boundless magnitude, stands the dwelling of one before whom all knees bow, and towards whose royal footstool none dares approach, save with downcast eyes and subdued voice. The entire world showers its bounties upon the head of that favoured mortal. A nation of millions does homage to the throne whereon that being is exalted. The dominion of this personage, so supremely blessed, 
extends over an empire on which the sun never sets, an empire greater than Genghis Khan achieved or Mohammed conquered. This is the parent of a mighty nation. And yet, around that parent's seat, the children crave for bread. Women press their little ones to their dried-up breasts in the agonies of despair. Young, delicate creatures waste their energies in toil, from the dawn of day till long past the hour of midnight, perpetuating their unavailing labour from the hour of the brilliant sun to that when the dim candle sheds its light around the attic's naked walls. And even the very pavement groans beneath the weight of grief which the poor are doomed to drag over the rough places of this city of sad contrasts. For in this city the daughter of the peer is nursed in enjoyments, and passes through an uninterrupted avenue of felicity from the cradle to the tomb, while the daughter of poverty opens her eyes at her birth upon destitution in all its most appalling shapes, and at length sells her virtue for a loaf of bread. There are but two words known in the moral alphabet of this great city, for all virtues are summed up in the one, and all vices in the other, and those words are wealth, poverty. Crime is abundant in this city. The Lazar House, the prison, the brothel, and the dark alley are rife with all kinds of enormity, in the same way as the palace, the mansion, the clubhouse, the parliament, and the parsonage, are each and all characterised by their different degrees and shades of vice. But wherefore specify crime and vice by their real names, since in the city of which we speak they are absorbed in the multi-significant words, wealth and poverty? Crimes borrow their comparative shade of enormity from the people who perpetrate them, Thus is it that the wealthy may commit all social offences with impunity, while the poor are cast into dungeons and coerced with chains, for only following at a humble distance in the pathway of their lordly precedents. From this city of strange contrasts branch off two roads, leading to two points totally distinct the one from the other. One winds its tortuous way through all the noisome dens of crime, chicanery, dissipation, and voluptuousness. The other meanders amidst rugged rocks and wearisome acclivities, it is true, but on the wayside are the resting places of rectitude and virtue. Along those two roads, two youths are journeying. They have started from the same point, but one pursues the former path and one the latter. Both come from the city of fearful contrasts, and both follow the wheels of fortune in different directions. Where is that city of fearful contrasts? Who are those youths who have thus entered upon paths so opposite the one to the other? And to what destinies do those separate roads conduct them? End of Prologue